Ladies and gentlemen, our next session will commence in three minutes. Please kindly, your, kindly take your seats and please get ready in line to join our next session, which will be the tutorial session at 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. Taipei time. Hi, Koji. Uh, it's perfect. I can see your screen. Uh, do you want to try to check if you, your mic is working? Yeah, actually, I can see the screen. But uh, do you see that the mic slide? Yeah, I can see your slide as well. I see the Moonshot logo. Okay, perfect. Bottom left. perfect. Yes, and I can hear you loud and clear. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Do you see the pointers now? Sorry, Koji, did you say something? Ah, could you see the, my laser pointer? Yeah, I can see your cursor. Uh, it's in red color. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to QCrypt 2022. And we will now proceed to the tutorial session. Uh, I think our speaker is ready. Online. So, first of all, we'd like to welcome the session chair, Lim Shi Wen. I think Charles, Charles Lim. Welcome. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, without further ado, let me quickly introduce Koji Azuma. So, Koji, you know, he received his PhD in physics from Osaka University in 2010. And in that very same year, he joined NTT Basic Research Lab, right? And his current interests are quantum information theory, sp specifically for building the theory for uh, quantum internet. He was then a visiting researcher at the University of Toronto from, I think, 2012 to 2018, and then the University of Cambridge in 2017, right? Uh, and more recently, I'll say from 2019, he's a guest associate professor of graduate school of engineering science of Sakai University, as well as uh, the distinguished scientist of NTT starting from 2018. Um, you know, I've been following Koji work for, for many, many years, right? And uh, he's a very famous researcher in quantum information theory as well as quantum repeater technology. And one of the work that I really liked a lot is his uh, nature of communications work in all photonic quantum repeaters, that, uh, whom he shared with uh, Kiyoshi Tamaki, a friend that we also both know, and uh, Professor Hoi Kong Lo from uh, University of Hong Kong, right? Uh, he recently moved there. And in that work, you know, they, they show that uh, the high demands, right, of a quantum repeater can be circumvent, right, uh, with an all photonic setup that is based on the you know, cluster state machine as well as a loss tolerant management scheme. So without further ado, Koji, I'll hand over the floor to you and uh, we look forward to receiving questions at the end of your presentation. Yeah, go ahead, Koji. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Could you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, then let's start. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to give a talk here. My name is Koji Azuma. Uh, the title of my talk today is Quantum Repeaters for Quantum Internet. Let's start. As you might know, one of our ultimate goals is to realize the so-called quantum internet. The concept of the quantum internet has been explicitly mentioned by Campbell in a paper published in Nature 2008. In fact, the title of the paper is the quantum internet itself, 
Besides, the paper motivates to consider the quantum internet by stating that quantum networks provide opportunity and challenges across a range of intellectual technical frontiers, including quantum computation, communication, and metrology. I completely agree with this notion. In fact, the concept of the quantum internet is abstract enough to include various kinds of quantum information processing tasks, such as quantum repeaters, distributed quantum computing, quantum simulation, a quantum network of clocks, and longer baseline telescopes. The one that building the quantum internet must be the ultimate challenge for us. What is a quantum internet? The quantum internet is a functionality of a quantum network to achieve quantum communication over the globe. Let us imagine a quantum communication network described by this graph. Then the functions of the quantum internet are explained as follows. The goal of the quantum internet is to supply arbitrary clients with entanglement efficiently. A node in this graph represents a quantum information processing node, such as a quantum computer or a quantum repeater. An edge in this graph represents a quantum channel, which is to convey a quantum system from one location to another location, like an optical fiber. The channel is in general noisy, thus it is described by a completely trace-preserving map, completely positive trace-preserving map, namely a CPTP map. In the case of a quantum internet, we assume that we can freely use local operation within each node and the classical communication among all the nodes. That is, we can freely use LOCC. The existence of this kind of free resource is different from the paradigm for the conventional internet. For example, an edge in the graph may represent optical fiber connecting distant places. The edge may represent a mode in the air connecting separated islands. The edge may correspond to a microwave transmission line connecting superconducting qubits. Or the edge may represent a mode in the free space connecting a satellite and a ground station. Therefore, the quantum internet is an abstraction of various kinds of possible quantum networks in the future. In this tutorial, I review what is a quantum internet and how to realize it. This is the goal of this tutorial. To accomplish such a goal, I start by clarifying the possible application of the quantum internet. By introducing such application, I want to emphasize that entanglement is a resource for various kinds of quantum information processing. Then I will explain how to share entanglement in practice and reveal the problem of direct quantum communication. And I will introduce the concept of the quantum repeater and explain its working mechanism. Then I will introduce the concept of the intercity QKD as a possible milestone. I also explain this the progress of the understanding of the capacity of quantum networks. Finally, I will mention about the possible next challenges for us. Then let's start by explaining the simplest application of a quantum internet. The simplest application of quantum internet is quantum teleportation. The quantum teleportation shows that once two clients, Alice and Bob, share a bell pair, a sender, Alice, can send her quantum information in a qubit to Bob just by sending two bits of classical information. This protocol implies that a quantum internet supplier in the future merely needs to give clients their pair to enable them to enjoy quantum communication. The advantage to use quantum teleportation protocol is that uh, the network supplier has no risk to hurt original quantum information clients and the supplier can use whatever method to present the pair it likes. Uh, next, uh, I would like to introduce the entanglement-based QKD. The main point of the entanglement-based QKD is that once Alice and Bob share a bell pair, they can obtain a bit of a secret key, which is used to accomplish probably secure communication combined with the so-called one-time path. In particular, if Alice and Bob apply GBS measurement on their shared bell state, then the measurement outcome satisfies three conditions to be a bit of a secret key. Namely, nobody can predict the bit values before the measurement, the bit values are completely correlated, and appear at random. Therefore, once Alice and Bob share bell state, they can obtain one bit of a secret key just by performing local measurements. 
Moreover, quantum mechanics allows Alice and Bob to check by themselves whether they share their pairs or not, even in a device independent manner. Therefore, if a network provider distributes their pair to clients, they can enjoy probably secure communication given by the one time path. Next, I will try to introduce a distributed quantum computation. The goal of the distributed quantum computation is to scale up and to increase functionality by connecting distant quantum processors by communication. The basis of the distributed quantum computing is to distribute a maximally entangled state between separated processors. This is because if we distribute a bell pair to separated processor like this, we can we can achieve Shinot gate under the LOCC. In this implementation, roughly speaking, the fidelity of the initial entanglement corresponds to the fidelity of the Shinot gate, while the rate of the entanglement distribution corresponds to the rate of available Shinot gate. Such a Shinot gate is the basis to implement fault-tolerant Shinot gates for logical qubits sitting on different processor if the fault-tolerant Shinot gate is implemented transversely. This is indeed a case for a fault-tolerant quantum computing based on the surface force or a surgery, for instance. Therefore, even if we want to achieve distributed quantum computation, the basis is to distribute maximally entangled state to distant qubits at a high rate. Next, I introduce the concept of the longer baseline telescope. Interferometry among the telescope array is a standard technique in astronomy. For example, the event horizon telescope collaboration uses a large telescope array to get a black hole shadow like this. In fact, the telescope array used there was composed of radio telescope. However, in general, we would like to detect light with an optical or infrared region. In this case, we need to use optical and infrared interferometry. The interferometer is used to resolve the location of the light at the place far from the Earth. And the resolution depends on the baseline B described here. Notice that a longer baseline B leads to a higher resolution of the telescope. However, in practice, the baseline B is limited to a few hundred meters because of the phase fluctuation and photon loss in the transmission to the interferometer. To overcome such a limitation of the baseline, Gottesman et al. proposed that we should distribute the pair in advance between distant telescopes and use them to perform the better measurement on distant optical policies the distant telescope can see. Therefore, again, the distribution of the maximally entangled state between distant telescopes is also the basis to achieve the longer baseline telescopes. Next, I introduce a so-called quantum network of crops. The final goal of the quantum network of clocks is to make a single international clock with a high precision. To do so, in the protocol, we prepare all the clock qubits distributed over the globe in a GHG state and then perform the x based measurement after the time evolution. The quantum protocol is shown to have square root improvement in terms of deviation of the center of mass frequency over classical ones. This is like an effect which appears in quantum metrology often. Besides, the quantum protocol guarantees security both from internal and external threats like QKD. Therefore, this application is based on the distribution of the ZHG state beyond the bell state and it has advantages over cluster synchronization. Therefore, as we have seen, all applications introduced here are based on sharing entanglement in advance. This implies that entanglement is a fundamental resource for various kinds of quantum information processing. Therefore, the fundamental task for a quantum internet protocol is considered to be distribute entanglement clients efficiently. Then the next question is how to distribute such an entanglement in practice? What is the problem? This question should be answered. The most practical way to distribute entanglement is to use flying qubits like photons. In this case, we can use fiber-based quantum communication, satellite-based quantum communication, and quantum repeaters. Therefore, the any quantum communication assumes photons as a carrier of quantum information. Thus, photons are considered to be necessary for achieving 
a quantum communication. Let us consider the simplest way to distribute entanglement, which is based on direct communication quantum information. In this scenario, Alice first generates a bell pair between her qubit and a single photon locally, and then she sends a single photon to Bo by using a quantum channel between them. Here, let us assume the length of the channel is L, and consider a do nothing middle node located at the center between Alice and Bo. Then net P of L is a transmission probability of a single photon for distance L. Then notice that the probability with which the single photon arrive at the middle node is described by P of L over 2 from the definition. Besides, the probability with which the single photon arrive at both the location is described by square of P of L over 2. Since this probability should be equivalent P of L from the definition, we obtain this type of equality. Notice that blue 2 here corresponds to square P, square of P. On the other hand, let L over 2 correspond to the argument L over 2 for the function P. Thus, if we repeat this consideration, we arrive at this equation. That is, the transmission probability from Alice to Bob is the transmission probability per unit length powered by L. Therefore, P of L is exponential with distance L. Notice that this discussion comes from the no cloning theorem of quantum information rather than some property special for single photon. That is, as long as we need to directly send something unique and uncopyable, this scaling occurs. This is a problem of the direct communication. For instance, in the case of optical fiber, the transmittance is 10% for 50 km. Thus, the transmittance of the optical fiber is multiplied 0.1 for every 50 km. Namely, the transmittance becomes 0.01 for 100 km and 0.001 for 150 km and so on. Therefore, to perform quantum communication against such an exponential increase of noise, we need to use a better method for the quantum details. Thus, I want to introduce the quantum repeaters. The original quantum repeater protocol is composed of three stages, entanglement generation, entanglement distillation, and entanglement swapping. The first stage is called the entanglement generation stage. In this stage, we try to, to generate entanglement between adjacent nodes. For example, we can use direct communication to generate entanglement. In general, the entanglement obtained by this entanglement generation protocol is not perfect. It includes error caused by imperfection of the devices. Therefore, after generating such multiple noisy entangled pair between adjacent nodes, we move, we move on to the second stage called the entanglement distillation stage. The goal of this entanglement distillation stage is to distill a stronger entangled pair from multiple noisy entangled pair by using LOCC. That is, by using multiple noisy entangled pair, we obtain a fewer number of entangled pair which have a higher fidelity than the fidelity of the original entangled pair. Through this stage, we have a situation such that all the adjacent nodes are connected by entangled pair with a high fidelity like this. Then we proceed to entanglement swapping stage. In this stage, every repeater node just applies a better measurement to pairs of qubits which have shared entanglement with its adjacent nodes. If this entanglement swapping succeeds, since this is essentially a sequence of quantum teleportation, Alice and Bob are connected by entangled pair. If this final entangled pair has a fidelity high enough to achieve some application, it can be used to directly for that. However, if the final entangled pair becomes weak for the application, we may again come back to the second stage, the entangled distillation stage, by regarding the final entangled pair of the swapping as the initial entanglement or the distillation. The output of the distillation can also be regarded as the initial entanglement or the swapping. That is, we can repeat the second and the third generation, uh, third stages until two end client obtain a longer and a high fidelity entangled pair. Notice that in this cycle, entanglement behaves as if it is a self-similar object. 
such a self similarity can be found even in the nature related with scaling up in general. Indeed, it is the basis of quantum beta like concatenation in quantum error operating flows. To understand the mechanism of scaling up, let's focus on the simplest quantum beta protocol called the Yuan Liu Kinshirak Zora protocol, i.e., DLC protocol, in short. The DLC type quantum repeater protocol based only on two stages, entanglement generation and swapping, thanks to the built in purification of the single photon based entanglement generation. For simplicity, we assume quantum memory, namely written by green qubit, are perfect, and the only source of noise is photon loss in the channel. For simplicity, in the entanglement generation stage, each repeater node first generates entanglement between a quantum memory and a single photon locally. Then the single photon is sent to the middle node. The node performs a linear optical bell measurement. If the bell measurement succeeds, as a feature of the same implementation called built-in purification in the original paper, a pretty high quality entangled pair is observed to a distant quantum memory. Namely, the fidelity of the obtained entangled pair is pretty high in this case. In fact, the original paper includes a figure to describe this protocol where the ensembles are used as quantum memory. This entanglement generation process succeeds probabilistically. Uh, the success probability is proportional to a function exponential with distance L between quantum memories. This is owing to the photon loss, which increases exponentially with distance L. Therefore, one can notice that entanglement distribution based on this method alone is extremely inefficient for long distances. Therefore, the entanglement generation protocol should be combined with entanglement swapping. The entanglement swapping is executed by performing bell measurement after confirming the successful sharing of bell state with adjacent nodes. This bell measurement especially can be called adaptive bell measurement. Again, the original DLC paper includes a figure to describe the situation where the excitation of atoms are transferred into photons and then bell measurement is implemented by using linear optical elements and the photon detector. In this case or in some other cases, the entanglement swapping works only probabilistically. But notice that success probability here depends only on imperfection of the local devices rather than distances. This is important. Now, I explain the working principle of quantum repeater. If you understand this guy, you would also understand the basic idea of quantum repeater. As I have said, the DLCG type repeater protocol is composed of the entanglement generation and entanglement swapping. For simplicity, here we assume the existence of a single repeater node between Alice and Bob. The repeater node starts by running entanglement generation protocol in parallel with Alice and with Bob. Suppose the success probability of each entanglement generation protocol is described by PG here. Then the average number of trials needed to share entanglement with both sides is about 1 over PG, thanks to quantum memory, which enables the repeater node to keep successfully established entanglement. After that, uh, we proceed to the entanglement swapping stage. Here we denote the success probability by PS. Then the average number of trials needed is described by 1 over PS. Suppose that if this entanglement swapping fails, we start again from the entanglement generation stage. Then the average total number of trials needed about the product of the trials needed in the entanglement generation and the swapping described by this. Then notice that this total trial number becomes smaller than the number of trials needed when we run entanglement generation protocol directly between Alice and Bob without using the repeater mode which is exponential is 2L0 according to the expression of the PG, where we need to replace L0 here with 2L0. Moreover, as long as the success probability PS of the entanglement swapping is constant, we see that single repeater node gives a square root improvement over direct entanglement generation. Namely, the existence of a single repeater node could present a square root improvement. Let us consider a bit complicated scenario where there are three repeater nodes between Alice and Bob. 
I see that considering the number of trials needed to establish entanglement here between Alice and Bob, we can see the total number of trials needed now described by this form, which is still merely exponential with distance L0 between adjacent repeater nodes. Therefore, although the existence of a single repeater node has already provided square root improvement, the existence of three repeater nodes presents further square root improvement described here. Similarly, if we have repeat, seven repeater nodes, we obtain further square root improvement, and if we have 15 repeater nodes, we have further square root improvement, and so on. Namely, just by adding repeater nodes to this protocol, which is that the number of trials needed increases exponentially. This is the essence of the exponential improvement of quantum repeater. By the way, this protocol also includes a self-similarity. In fact, this protocol proceeds like a knockout tournament manner. This is a self-similarity inside the protocol. Okay, so far we have seen that the DLCG type protocol work with the use of perfect quantum memory. However, in practice, quantum memory have only finite coherence time implying the decay of the stored quantum information exponentially with time. Besides, the protocol requires memory time to be proportional to classical communication time over total distance. Unfortunately, this classical communication is essential in the protocol to herald the success of entanglement generation and swapping. Therefore, that when the coherence time of matter quantum memory is finite, the scaling of the protocol becomes exponential with the communication distance. Thus, the protocol may not work as we expect unless the coherence time of matter quantum memory is extremely long. Therefore, new quantum repeater scheme or the second and third generation are proposed. In the second generation quantum repeater protocols, we regard quantum memory, i.e. green qubit, as a logical qubit based on the quantum electric form, and we assume that we can apply the Better measurement to the logical qubits deterministically rather than probabilistically. In the entanglement generation protocol, we replace the repeat until strategy with the use of multiplexing. Namely, now each repeater node has many physical qubits. Since we assume to be able to use deterministic better measurement here, all the repeater nodes can apply the better measurement soon after the entanglement generation step finishes. Therefore, this protocol tries to minimize the required memory time at the expense of the additional assumption of the use of the deterministic pair measurement and the quantum error correcting code and multiplexing. In this case, the depth of the quantum error correcting code for the quantum memory, i.e. for green qubit, and depends only on the distance L0 between adjacent repeater nodes. Besides, the repetition rate of this protocol is proportional to the repetition rate of the entanglement generation protocol. As a result, the required resource, i.e., the total number of physical qubits needed in this case, could be proportional to a function exponentially with distance adjacent to no, between adjacent repeater nodes, L0. Notice that this scaling occurs even if we use matter qubits with finite coherence time. Therefore, second generation repeater protocol works even with matter qubits with finite coherence time. At this point, there is a fundamental question whether do we need to use quantum memory to achieve quantum repeaters or not. Actually, this is answered no. Uh, in fact, it was shown that quantum error correcting codes enable us to send quantum information from Alice to Bob over long distances by using matter qubits, not as memories, but as information processing qubits. In the context of the quantum computing, quantum elaborating codes are normally used to keep quantum information a long time. But uh, in this repeater protocol, quantum elaborating codes are used to transmit quantum information over space, namely from Alice to Bob. This protocol shows that the memory function of the matter qubit is not necessary. Besides, this protocol is pretty speedy. This scheme this type of scheme, i.e. one-way communication, is now called third generation in our community. Moreover, we have shown that quantum repeaters are possible without matter quantum memory at all, that is, by using optical devices. Namely, we now have even all quantum repeaters. 
In particular, the old photonic quantum repeater protocol uses only optical devices such as the linear optical elements, single photon sources, photon detectors, fast active and fast active field photon techniques. That's it. We do not need to use matter quantum memory at all. This protocol has several advantages coming from the unnecessity of matter credits. The first is that repetition rate of this protocol could be increased as high as one once, similar to the third generation. This is because a repeater in this protocol just needs to generate and distribute a photonic cluster state to its adjacent node, described by this figure. The second is that this protocol does not need quantum interfaces such as coherent frequency converter for photons because this protocol can use telecom photons throughout. The third is that all the elemental components written here are simpler than matter quantum memory. The fourth is that it could work at room temperature in principle. The fifth is that this is the only scheme which is proven to be much simpler than the same type of a quantum computer, i.e. all photonic quantum computer proposed by Mirla from Mirla. This means that the realization of an all photonic quantum repeater is a natural milestone for an all photonic quantum computer. The main idea of this is to take time reversal of the DLC type quantum repeater, more precisely the time reversal of the second generation quantum repeater scheme. If you are interested in this protocol, you can check my talk at Peer Group 2050 in the YouTube. Therefore, we can now several kinds of repeater protocols. The differences are summarized in this table. For instance, other quantum memories are needed from past to third generation, but not needed for all quantum quantum repeaters. First generation quantum repeaters do not, do not need gates among quantum memory, but second and third generation protocol needs such a gates. Therefore, compared with second and third generation, first generation looks practical apparent. However, the memory time required by first generation protocol is pretty long, and thus first generation protocol is pretty slow. In fact, the repetition rate of the protocol increases in order of first generation, second generation, third and all potent scheme. This is a summary of the generation of the quantum repeater protocol. Therefore, that I have introduced the quantum repeater protocols, however, it is challenging to realize them. Thus, I would like to introduce a milestone before going to the development of quantum repeater, which we call intensity QKD. As we have seen, we now have not only direct transmission of photons, but also quantum repeater to distribute entanglement. Then the question here is whether there is an intermediate category of quantum communication schemes. If we see the direct quantum communication scheme, the achievable distances are about 400 km as long as we use optical fiber. On the other hand, quantum repeaters have no limitation on the achievable distances. Therefore, the direct communication schemes would be used to connect to intra-city distances even in the future, while quantum repeater would be used to connect intercontinental distances. Thus, we expect uh, such a possible intermediate category to cover intercity distances, that is, to connect to major cities in the country. How about the point technology? The direct communication schemes are ready for practical use. On the other hand, quantum repeaters are still challenging because of the necessity of quantum memories or quantum error correcting code. Thus, we expect such a possible intermediate category to be intermediate even in terms of the required technology. For instance, it is favorable if they work without quantum error correcting code or long coherence time quantum memory. Indeed, we have already had several protocols which could be classified into this category, such as memory step MDI QKD, or photonic interest QKD, twin field QKD, and post pairing QKD. The first three examples here were reviewed by Marco Luca Marina at Crypto 2018. Thus, if you are interested in it, you can check the video in the YouTube. On the other hand, since the post pairing QKD was proposed very recently, I would like to introduce it here. The post pairing QKD is like an intermediate between the all photonic intensity QKD and the same field QKD. All-photonic intensity QKD and the same field QKD 
also present square root improvement over P2P QKD in terms of the performance. The bell measurement in the old photonic intercity QKD is based on the two photon interference to discriminate the bell states of the polarization single photon qubit described by this. While the bell measurement in the twin field QKD is based on the single photon interference to discriminate bell states, if it's composed of a vacuum state and the single photon state described by Francisco. To see the difference, let us consider the phase shift or annihilation operator. In the case of the two photon interference, the effect of the phase shift appears different in the phase only between polarization in Alice's channel and between polarization in Bob's channel. Thus, this effect can be cancelled out if both polarizations receive the same phase shift in each channel. This is important. On the other hand, if we consider the same effect or the case of the single photon interference, the effect appears as a difference in phase between Alice's pulse and Bob's pulse. Besides, the phase shift occurs proportionally to the frequency of photons, i.e. very speedy. Therefore, that the to achieve the twin field QKD, we need to stabilize the phase evolution in Alice and Bob's channel intensively. A recently proposed post-pairing QKD is a trial to avoid use of single photon interference requiring intense phase stabilization. The protocol still uses a measurement based on single photon interference, like twin field QKD. But in that protocol, Alice and Bob send optical policies to the middle node sequentially to use a merit of multiplexing like all photonic intercity QKD. The essence of this design is to post select event where a bell measurement is successfully applied to time beam qubits. But in contrast to normal time beam qubits, time beams here could be separated over very long distance, taken by I and J here. For this bell measurement, if we consider the same phase shift for a time phase operator, the effect is very similar to that in the case of the two photon interference, as you can confirm from here. Therefore, this protocol is regarded to be essentially based on the two photon interference rather than single photon interference. This is an innovative part of this protocol. If the can phase cancellation occur even for widely separated time beam, this protocol presents a square root improvement in performance similar to the whole photon intensity QKD and twin field QKD. As a result, the protocol could also outperform the capacity of the P2P optical from QKD by using two photon interference. In this graph, uh, this linear line, is an almost linear line, is the capacity of the P2P QKD. Thus, you can see that the performance of this protocol could outperform such a P2P capacity. Therefore, the realization of this QKD scheme, which can outperform the capacity of P2P QKD protocol, is important not only as a solution for interstate communication, but also a milestone for quantum repeater. So far, we have considered various kinds of protocols. Next, we would like to change the topics a little bit. Uh, that is, we consider possible performance, which is achievable in principle, namely capacity of quantum networks, and how to bound them. As I have introduced, the goal of the quantum internet is to supply arbitrary client with entanglement efficiently. However, what is the most primitive function of the quantum internet? It must be two-party communication over the network. In this case, the goal becomes the most difficult. That is, the goal can be regarded to, to give two clients, Alice here and Bob here, for example, with E bits for quantum teleportation or P bits for QKD. Then the main question here is how much efficiently we can provide E bits or private bits to Alice and Bob. This paper have tried to answer this question on the potential of quantum meter. To answer this question, we start by defining. No, Sorry. Okay, to answer the question, we start by defining the most general protocol. Of course, any protocol needs to start by preparing separable state. In this preparation, they may use LOCC as well. 
Then we use a quantum channel to send a quantum system from one node to another node. After that, we perform the LCC, which presents outcome K1 with some probability P K1. Then depending on the outcome of the LCC operation, we may use a quantum channel in the network. Then we perform the LCC, which presents outcome K2 with some probability conditioned by previous outcome K1. We continue to use a quantum channel and the LCC ultimately until we get a favorable outcome. After the final round, say else round, all the nodes share quantum state law. However, since the current goal of the quantum internet protocol is to present E bits or P bits to Alice and Bob, the release density operator for Alice and Bob's system should be extremely close to the target state tau, such as a maximally entangled state or private state, from which we can distill this size of E bits or private bits. Now, we want to derive an upper bound on the possible performance of such a general quantum internet protocol. To do so, we introduce a bold idea here. In particular, we consider bipartition of the network by introducing two fictitious parties called Big Alice and Big Bob. The Big Alice has not only Alice's node, but also several other nodes, while the Big Bob has all the other nodes, including Bob's node. For instance, in this graph, we can assume that a big Alice has all the nodes in this orange region, while a big Bob has all the other nodes in this blue region. Then we can regard that given quantum internet protocol as just point-to-point -point communication between big Alice and big Bob. And we can apply a upper bound to this simple P2P communication between big Alice and big Bob. As long as we are interested in deriving upper bound in the performance, this should be okay. Because uh, if there is a quantum internet protocol which finally provides some size of E bits or P bits to original Alice and Bob, then the protocol should at least provide the same size of E bits or P bits to the big Alice and the big Bob. Therefore, the upper bound on the P2P communication between Big Alice and Big Bob should also be an upper bound on the original quantum internet protocol between Alice and between and Bob. For simplicity, uh, here let us follow the Takeoka to have weird bound on the quantum or private capacity from point to point scheme. As a result, we obtain this type of very simple upper bounds. Namely, for any choice of the bipartition, that is, for any choice of big Alice and big Bob, the average size of obtainable E bits of private in, it, in the left hand side is upper bounded by the right hand side of this inequality. The second term uh, in this right hand side, G epsilon, becomes negligibly small if epsilon becomes zero. Uh, here, L bar E. It represents the average number of uses of quantum channel and E. This ESQ describes the scarcity entanglement of the channel. Besides the summation here, it's taken over all the edges connecting big Alice and big one. Most importantly, this upper bound is a single letter formula. Namely, we can always estimate the right hand side, at least its upper bound. Since we now have an estimatable upper bound on the size of obtainable E bits or private bits, let us compare it with the performance of existing protocol. First, let us consider the simplest network where there is only a middle repeater node between Alice and Bob. The middle node is connected to Alice and Bob with optical fibers. The interest QPD protocols I have already introduced work over this type of networks. Besides, we have already known that the protocol presents a square root improvement over P2P QPD scheme. For instance, we compare the performance of the all potent interest QKD with such a general upper by using this graph. In this graph, the horizontal axis represents the distance between Alice and Bob, while the vertical axis describes the key rate per channel use. The upper bound for the network is described by dashed green curve one here, while the performance of the all potent interstitial KD is described by solid green curve two here. 
As you can see, the performance of the all potent intercity QKB has no scaling gap with upper bound. This implies that the obtained upper bound here is pretty good. Besides, we see that we cannot dramatically improve existing intercity QKB protocol in terms of the performance anymore. Similarly, we can consider linear fiber network. Quantum repeater protocol work over this type of network. Even in this case, by considering idealized achievable quantum repeater protocol corresponding to the second generation quantum repeater scheme, we see again there is no scaling gap between the performance of such a achievable quantum repeater protocol and the general upper bound. In this graph, the dashed curve represents the upper bound while the solid curve represents uh, performance of such an achievable second generation protocol. In this graph, uh, N represents the number of repeater nodes between alpha and mode. Therefore, we can also conclude that obtaining the upper bound is pretty good, as well as we cannot dramatically improve some of the existing quantum repeater protocols in terms of the performance anymore. Also, I have introduced upper bound based on the scarcity entanglement. We now have another upper bound based on the relative entropy of entanglement. This bound is based on the hybrid use of the relative entropy of entanglement and of max relative entropy of entanglement. In particular, given choice of the bipartition, the upper bound uses the relative entropy of entanglement for the so-called choice mirable channels, while it uses the max relative entropy of entanglement for the other channels. This upper bound is also in a single letter formula, thus we can always estimate. This bound is a generalized version of a relative entropy upper bound originally given by Pirandra. Uh, we now have uh, introduced uh, general upper bounds on the obtainable EBITs of private bits through a quantum internet protocol over arbitrary network. Thus, we want to introduce the quantum internet protocol which works over any quantum network beyond linear networks, which is called aggregated quantum repeater protocols. This protocol looks like parallelizing quantum repeater protocol, by the way. Suppose that we are given the maximum number of uses of each channel here. Then the aggregated quantum repeater protocol is defined by the following two steps. The first step is to run entanglement generation scheme by using every quantum channel a load number, maximum number of times. And this type of, by using this type of channel. This entanglement generation is assumed to be combined with the entanglement distribution if necessary. As a result, we can assume that this entanglement generation steps present delta cross L times R delta E copies of a bell pair. Here, R represents the efficiency of the entanglement generation. Through the entanglement generation protocol, we obtain a bell pair network exemplified by this multigram. Here, each edge corresponds to an EBIT. For instance, between C6 and C5, we have two edges now, i.e. two EBITs after the entanglement generation. At this point, the channel network is converted into a bell pair network Thus, we can focus on this bell pair network. Notice that uh, one AB pass in this bell pair network can be transformed into one EBIT between Alice and Bob if we perform entanglement swapping along with this pass. Therefore, the second step of the aggregated quantum repeater protocol is to perform entanglement swapping along the AB passive to supply Alice and Bob with EBITs as many as possible. Thus, this protocol looks like a parallelizing quantum repeater protocol between Alice and Bob. Then the question here is how many distinct AB passes exist in, the, in this given bell pair network? This is answered by Mengard's theorem in the graph theorem. This theorem states that in any graph D with two distinguished nodes A and B, the maximum number of pairwise edge disjoint AB passes is equal to the minimum number of edges in an AB cut. If we replace uh, this AB cut by using the concept of bit Alice and bit Bob here, the number of edges in the AB cut means the number of edges connecting the bit Alice and the bit Bob. 
For example, let us consider the following big cards in this one for this network. In the case of this multiple, this choice of the big cards and the big group, that is AB cut, presents a minimum number of edges in AB cut. In this case, three. In fact, as suggested by Menda's theorem, in this graph, we can easily find three distinct AB passes, green, blue, and orange passes in this graph. These three passes can be transformed into the three E bits between Alice and Bob by performing entanglement swapping. Therefore, in general, Alice and Bob obtain this number of E bits with error described by this. Remember the form of upper bound, which is described by this, where the capital epsilon represents here, yeah, uh, represents an entanglement of the channel, such as a scarcity entanglement or the hybrid relative entropy of entanglement. This upper bound is the same form as the E bit obtained the aggregated quantum repeater protocol. Therefore, if there is no gap between the efficiency R and the entanglement of the channel epsilon or every edge, there is no gap between the performance of the aggregated protocol and the upper bound. In fact, this is the case for the quantum networks composed of pure loss channels. This is because there are efficient entanglement generation protocols, such as one based on single photon transmission or coherence transmission, satisfying G2 relation. Therefore, at least in the case of optical fiber networks, the aggregate quantum repeater protocol has no scaling gap with upper bound. Besides, it gives a lower bound on the zero performance of any quantum network. Namely, if the aggregated quantum repeater protocol uses entanglement generation over each quantum channel with rate described by this one and the error described by this one, the aggregated quantum repeater protocol gives a performance between the left hand side of this inequality. This is a lower bound on the maximum size of E bits of private bits obtainable in principle. Notice that efficiency R becomes a two way quantum capacity by taking a proper limit. By noting this, we can show that our upper and lower bound bound capacity as well. To see this, we first define the quantum or private capacity for a quantum network formally. First, let P describe the set of all protocols which use each quantum channel at the most n times, a few times. Then the capacity part time is defined by this equation. In this case, Fe represents a rate of available channel uses per unit time, and then parameter n represents a time. Notice that this capacity defined for fixed Fe Intuitively, to maximize the rate of time, we want to minimize the time to establish some fixed size of entanglement between clients. Therefore, this capacity is achieved only if we use a protocol which uses channels connecting Alice and Bob as many as possible, like an aggregated quantum repeat. For this capacity, our upper and lower bounds provide inequality in the sandwich form. We can also define the capacity per total channel use by maximizing the capacity per time or by normalizing parameter FE, like this. Since FE is normalized now, like this, FE represents the frequency of channel uses, and thus N, parameter N here, represents the total number of channel uses. Intuitively, to maximize the rate per total channel use, we want to minimize the channel uses to generate some fixed size of entanglement between clients. Therefore, this capacity is achieved only if we use a protocol which chooses and uses the best pass of channels connecting Alice and Bob only. Thus, to obtain performance closer to this capacity, we need to find the best pass in the quantum network. For this capacity, our upper and lower bounds provide uh, inequality uh, in this sandwich form. Most importantly, from a fundamental viewpoint, the lower and upper bound actually coincide with the upper bound with the relative entropy for arbitrary networks composed of so-called distillable channels, such as the dephasing channels and lossy bosonic channels. Therefore, the aggregated quantum repeater protocol achieves the quantum or private capacities of arbitrary quantum networks composed of distillable channels. 
Besides upper and lower bounds in similar forms are obtained in scenarios to distribute bipartite entanglement over multiple pair of clients and distribute multipartite entanglement such as GHE state or multipartite private state to a set of clients. Moreover, this calculation can be done very efficiently by using linear programs. This efficient calculation is important for a network supplier in the future to determine a way to distribute entanglement over clients as quickly as possible according to the request from the client in the network. The main idea of this paper, the prepared formal paper, is to consider the dual linear program by using max from impact theorem to change the mean max in the bound into a simple maximization. Anyway, these recent progresses on the understanding of network capacity are now summarized in this review paper. If you are interested in, please check this reference. Now we can summarize the current theoretical viewpoint on the quantum internet as follows. The quantum internet is a global quantum communication network composed of the quantum information processing node and the quantum channels. Such a quantum internet is regarded as a holy grail of quantum information processing with various applications such as probably secure communication, quantum teleportation, and cloud computing, and so on. The aggregated quantum repeater protocol is an efficient internetization scheme, which looks like a polarizing repeater protocol has no scaling gap with the quantum or private capacity of any pure optical fiber network. Therefore, a fundamental building block is quantum repeaters, even in the context of the realization of a quantum internet. Finally, I would like to consider what are the next challenges. Recently, two of the old photon quantum repeater, two groups in Japan, Canada, and in China have succeeded in confirming the working principle of a time reverse implementation of the adaptive value measurement, which corresponds to the entanglement plotting in the quantum repeater protocol. Yamamoto's group at Osaka University used the three photon GHG state while the PANS group at USTC used a 12 photon interferometer. Similarly, the proof of work proofs principle experiment for the adaptive field measurement have already been performed even with the matter quantum memory towards quantum repeaters. Lukin's group at Harvard used the silicon data shaker center in a diamond nanophotonic cavity. Durand group used the division atomic ensembles. Lempet's group used the two division atom in a high finish cavity. And Hanson's group uh, uses the energy center in, in diamonds. Why is such adaptive value measurement is important? Uh, notice that we have already known the limitation of the PCP QKD scheme, i.e., the private capacity of a Russian bosonic channel. This bound, called low bound nowadays, is described by this form by using uh, the transmitters of the Russian channel. Moreover, Existing P2P QKD protocols such as BB84 have no scaling gap with APAP. Therefore, there is no hope for the extending achievable distances even in principle as long as we use P2P configuration of the network. Therefore, the next step is to utilize a single node to outperform the P2P capacity. In fact, the adaptive value measurement of the middle node C presents a square root improvement over P2P scheme like intensity QKD. Therefore, it is a definitive milestone for quantum repeaters to achieve this improvement and show its advantage in practice, namely beyond the proof of principal experiment. This is an experimental big challenge. What is a theoretical challenge? Recently, are consider how we can continuously cover the globe by using the constellation of orbiting satellites that provide a continuous on-demand entanglement distribution service to two ground stations. Besides, Leon et al. suggests that in principle we may be able to put a quantum repeater even in a satellite. By considering this proposal, we may now have an important open question. The first open question is what is the most cost-efficient design of a global quantum internet? We may need to start to think about the cost to build up such a quantum internet. Especially this is mentioned by my collaborator, Professor Hoi Kondo. Uh, related to this first question, the second open question is where we should put quantum repeaters on. 
for instance, should we put a repeater on a satellite or undersea? In this case, is it better to put an all photonic repeater rather than matter based repeater by considering the unnecessity of dilution collisions? The third open question is what kind of overall design, including middleware and software, is needed to connect quantum networks developed in pieces? This question arises because in the future we may want to connect various kinds of quantum networks where the various kinds of hardware or devices may be used. Therefore, it would be important to answer this open question before going to the real world development of a quantum internet. Finally, I'd like to thank all my collaborators related to the research about the quantum internet. Thank you for your kind interest. Uh, thank you, Koji, for the very nice and comprehensive, you know, tutorial on quantum repeater technology. Um, yeah, so let us open the, 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 the session to the floor as well. And students, postdocs, or even faculty members would like to ask questions, you know, please feel free to, to use our Q&A uh, chat function that you have. Uh, ask the question there, I'll read it out for you. Uh, for those who are live, you know, in, in the theater, you know, you just raise your hand and the, the organizer will come and get you. Yeah, so yeah, any questions, please feel free to bring them forward. Any questions here on site? Oh, yes, we do have a question here. Uh, when you say uh, entanglement generation until succeeds, uh, before error correction, how do you check it succeed? Yeah, before error correction, ah, okay. Okay, thank you for the question. And I need to go back to the slide, maybe here. Your question is like, uh, how to check the whether the entanglement generation succeeds or not, right? Yeah, this is indeed a, a, not so difficult. Namely, normally that uh, we first generate the entanglement locally and the single photon is sent it to a middle node. And uh, in this case, in this sample setup, if the single photon is found in the photon detector, then we can notice that, uh, okay, entanglement is established between the quantum memory, thanks to uh, this implementation. The success probability is a uh, max success probability is a uh, 50%, but uh, we can uh, identify whether entanglement generation protocol succeeds or not. Does this answer your question? So you mean it's through physical device? Indeed, indeed. Photon detector clicks, actually. OK, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we do have another question here. Uh, yes. Uh, when you were discussing this uh, upper bounds. OK. Mm -hmm. So when you, you said something about uh, estimatable, Upper bound. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that this is achievable? Right? These are different things. Ah, different thing. That's a nice question. Thank you for the question. Actually, in the case of discussion entanglement, for example, this is estimatable. But uh, uh, but uh, we can estimate. Actually, we can derive upper bound. In this case, for example, this but the upper bound is enough to bound the left hand side, right? If we know that. Uh, upper bound, it's okay. But on the other hand, and uh, in the case of the relative entropy of entanglement, we can exactly derive the, uh, this quantity in the case of the pure loss bosonic channels. Well, we can exactly derive this quantity, like this quantity. And uh, well, uh, yeah, well, uh, such a sandwich formula as uh, we have shown. This side. Yeah, and the sandwich form, uh, normally uh, we can estimate the right hand side. In the case of pure loss photonic channel, we have already known the capacity as well. In order that we, we can sandwich, we can use this sandwich formula to know the capacity. In the case of the uh, quantum network based on the pure loss photonic channel, in such a case, uh, the upper and lower bound coincide. In order that this sandwich Inequality becomes tight. Normally, this becomes equal as an equal. 
Ah, okay, yeah, thank you very much. Similar discussion can be applied to the even the lower bound. Because the, if we have some specific entanglement generation protocol, we can estimate the achievable performance, RE. This RE is a lower bound of the quantum capacity in general. Therefore, even if we cannot uh, derive the quantum capacity, we can have uh, this type of inequality. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Any other question here? Uh, we have a question in the Q and A. Okay. Yeah, I'll just read it out. So the the question is by Abhishek Sadhu. Uh, he has a very basic question. Uh, can you please explain what do you mean by deterministic Bell measurement, and are there any physical limitations on it? Okay. Thank you very much for the very nice question, and uh, I can go back to the normally. That, uh, okay, this is a typical bit of measurement, like uh, in the case of. Uh, in the case of the DLC type quantum repeater, we implement a measurement by using linear optical element and the photon detector. As I said, the measurement succeeds only when the detector clicks, one of the detector clicks. In this case, we know that, uh, okay, the measurement is applied. However, uh, uh, this successfulty one over two, but, uh, we cannot make regarded this measurement as a deterministic one. On the other hand, uh, what is meant by deterministic measurement is, uh, for example, in the case if we use uh, matter qubits, for example, we can have a uh, Hamiltonian evolution between the two quantum memory in principle. In this case, at the, in principle, we can, we can apply the better measurement directly for two matter qubits. For example, we can imagine that maybe green qubit may be composed of the single atoms. In such a case, by a Applying the microwave, for example, we can directly control the time evolution of such a supermatter qubit. After that, we can perform some measurement. Such a bell measurement becomes a bell, uh, deterministic one. Indeed, indeed, uh, this type of experiment is performed in the, by using this type of system, uh, like a, uh, this is probabilistic, but uh, in the case of NV center in a diamond, we can perform the bell measurement between the nuclear spin and the electron spin inside a single diamond. This is meant by deterministic bell measurement. Probabilistic bell measurement can be uh, can appear so far maybe almost based on the linear optical implementation of this. Does this answer your question? I guess you did. He's not responding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, to the local organizer on site, uh, are there any more questions? Are there any more questions here on site? Oh yeah, we do have one question here on site. Hi Koji. Um, um, I think it's clear that uh, if you want to lay out quantum internet, it's going to be very challenging because we need to have in addition to the existing infrastructures, we need to lay out, let's say, completely new layers of infrastructures. Um, what do you anticipate is the time frame for this? Um, uh, many years? You know what, yeah, so the goal is uh, pretty separated between the theory and uh, experiment. As I said, in the case of the experiment, anyway, we need to develop uh, uh, matter qubit uh, or photonic system so that we can apply the adaptive bell measurement to improve the scaling of the quantum communication. On the other hand, from the theoretical side, uh, we now have a, we have already known the capacity of upper bound, the lower bound, etc. And what uh, we now need to maybe start to design, at least uh, such a design should work least to control this type of configuration of the quantum data network. And uh, this is, yeah, I, I hope that this type of experiment uh, can be done in practice, but still uh, under the, just a proof of principle experiment in the lab. And uh, I cannot predict when uh, such a development is really needed 
in the future. But then we need to, we can start to think about this one. Yeah, that's my opinion. So foreseeable future. Possible future, yeah. Okay. Like uh, there was uh, maybe my collaborator Hoi Kong suggested that maybe we need to, okay, quantum internet should be pretty great. However, we need to start think about how much cost is needed to build up a quantum internet as well. Uh, yeah, this is related to this uh, uh, merit to use quantum internet and uh, cost, right? Uh, uh, we need to think about more such a time frame or etc. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, very nice question. Yeah, I, I do have one more question online. Uh, it's asked by a very smart student. His name is uh, Emilien Lavi. Uh, so he's asking the central node in TwinField QKD acts like a repeater without memory, right? And can help beat the point to point linear bound. Uh, he's asking, do you think it would be possible to have a QKD protocol similar to TwinField with more nodes and a scaling that beats, you know, the square root bound? Okay, thank you for the nice question. Actually, that uh, we want to have, but in my opinion, it could be very difficult. Actually, such a comment was mentioned by our paper in this paper. And uh, because of twin field QKD or all the twin test QKD is based on the assumption, to, uh, uh, like a, in the case of QKD, we have us, we can utilize a special property between to the for the two end nodes. Alice and Wolf, we can assume to this three of private, private key. We can assume that Alice and Wolf have a all tolerant quantum computer locally or virtually. However, Alice and Wolf in some sense have a very long coherence time attack quantum memory or more. Like Alice and Wolf can, can be assumed to have a universal quantum computer without any loss or noises in the case of QKD application. However, really we want to build up a quantum repeater. We need to really have something quantum to perform the better measurement. For example, for example, like uh, if we remember this type of configuration. Actually, at the, okay, this matter quantum memory here at the like, image. The measurement here, uh, this memory should exist here, right? In the case of uh, twin field QKD, we can assume, okay, in the case of we just use a single beta node, this node and this node held by Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob have a perfect quantum memory or quantum computer. There was the, we, this middle repeater node need to just perform their measurement. On the other hand, this node need to keep the quantum information until receive the flooding signal of the successful measurement here. Therefore, this repeater node really requires to have a quantum memory in this case. In the case of all the implementation, this implies we need to use quantum error code. to achieve quantum repeater, by, namely by adding repeater nodes more, uh, maybe in my opinion, uh, we need to have a quantum something. Like uh, many, we need to expand the quantum body like a quantum computing community. And of course, uh, if we issue you can find, then uh, it's a game changer. Please try. But uh, in my opinion, uh, it seems to be very, very difficult or more it looks like impossible. This is my opinion. Thanks, Koji. Uh, the question, uh, I guess, has been answered. Uh, any more questions from the audience on site and also online? Oh, yeah, we do have one question here on site. Hi. Uh, I think in the introduction, you have mentioned one example of the repeater network in distributed telescopes that, that they use for picturing the black hole. So, ah, okay. what, what do you use for the black hole actually? Black yeah. hole is shadow is already uh, so, captured by using on that. So, how, what is the size of multipartite entangled state they have generated, or is it bipartite when they ah. come from distant telescope to interfere them to make the picture? Ah, 
Ah, okay, that's a nice question. Actually, as I said, that the to make up a telescope array for the uh, to capture the photons in the optical or infrared region, we need to this type of quantum interferometer. Then the question is uh, how much, what, at least that maybe we want to beyond the current limitation. Like uh, now, according to this paper, the baseline for the optical and infrared interferometer seems to be, the baseline is limited a few hundred meters now. Then what, if we can beyond this distance, it's okay. But uh, actually, that this entanglement relation should be made very quickly because of the, this, I can, we cannot predict when the light comes normally without, uh, without predicting big event in the universe, for example. And therefore, normally we need to distribute this bell pair rapidly to the such a uh, distant uh, uh, telescopes. Therefore, the, yeah, this is challenging part. Therefore, this paper says that we need to have a, a very rapid preparation with this bell measurement, a uh, bell uh, state. They also they require us to use quantum repeater. However, that, uh, actually we need to take care of such uh, uh, strict comparison. How much baseline or how how long the baseline is needed really to be beyond the current limitation on the baseline telescope or the optical vision photons. Yeah, actually I don't have any clear answer, but we need to start to seriously consider well, how how long the baseline is needed and uh, how much rate of that entanglement distribution distribution is needed here. Yeah, thank you for the nice question. Yeah. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Any more questions from on site and online? Okay, if not, uh, Koji, I have some questions. In fact, two questions. I have a really <laughs> okay. basic question, a uh, truly basic question. Can you go back to the earlier slides that you talked about, you know, uh, direct comms, right? The single photon. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I can go back. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so here you, you argue that, you know, um, quantum information, if you were to transmit a single photon over long distance, then you have this uh, exponential scaling issue, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, what you're doing here, in a way, you're assuming that um, a single photon equates a qubit. Is that right? Yeah, this is uh, more like uh, just a simple uh, Gedanke experiment. We are uh, just a single photon, perfect polarization single photon. Is to that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so my, my you know, the, the second part to this question is that a single photon can be more than a single qubit, right? It can be multiple qubits. Ah, uh, you mean, okay. Uh, that's a nice question. Yeah. But the, mm. But this is also not really the, the, the middle of the question, right? The, the, the other half of it, when you look at it from the other way, is that you can also encode a single qubit across multiple photons, right? Like a here, Yeah, single photon means that they're just like a bosonic space spanned by a vacuum or a single photon or a single photon polarization space. This is mm -hmm. uh, what it means by this one. Yeah. But uh, your question is based on that uh, we could encode many, many degree of freedom for the optical parts, in, right? But uh, this uh, essentially, that was answered by probe bound, right? Yes. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There was, uh, maybe, of course, uh, this, this consideration is very simplified. But even if we encode uh, more degree of freedom for the single model, of the annihilation filter. Anyway, this scaling occur uh, according to the probe bound. This is a main result of the yeah. probe bound. Then what the, yeah. of so, the, hey, go, go ahead, sorry. Yes, uh, somebody is telling me time is up, but I'd like to finish <laughs> my question. So yeah, here is that we can also, you know, encode a qubit into, you know, uh, multiple photons, right? And that would essentially bring us to the to the repeater scheme based on quantum error correction code. Mm -hmm. So would you agree that you know by increasing by breaking the assumption that a single photon means a, a, a qubit, right? You essentially would be able to overcome this this bound that you you mentioned here. Mm -hmm. you know what the, yeah, but the, 
at least in my opinion, that we need to use a multi mode or the bosonic mode. Otherwise, because that this was given by a proban, they are the to come up with a nice idea, we may need to utilize several modes, optical mode or bosonic mode, to beyond this bound. That's my yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess this would be the end of the QA. And of course, you know, we have a networking session right after this uh, tutorial. So for those of you who want to stay back and you know ask Koji more questions or ask uh, Liang Kerke about what funding he would have. You know, moving forward with respect to quantum internet, please uh, tune to that session. Otherwise, let us give you know uh, Koji a round of applause and thank him for his effort for this tutorial. Thank you, thank you, thank you Koji, and thank you Charles for moderating this session. And um, our next session will be at four forty-five Taipei time. So please join us back at four forty-five Taipei time for our next session. Thank you. And for our audience on site, uh, we have snacks and coffee and tea served at the hallway as well. So please enjoy and be back at 4.45. Thank you. <laughs>